um, in the Ventura field office. Mm -hmm. I'm you today about the monarch butterfly 12 month finding. Um, we can find all the information that I will present here and more, um, as well as an email address where you can send us any comments, questions, or suggestions you have. I can also take questions at the end of this presentation, depending on your, your all's time and availability. So did the, did the slide change for you all? Yes. Okay, I think we're, we're up and running. Okay, great. So, so this presentation is a high level overview about the monarch butterfly, its range, population, and migration. Um, I'll talk about the petition to list the monarch butterfly, the process that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service followed to conduct a rigorous species status assessment, and then what our finding, which is warranted but precluded, means and some next steps. Um, I'll close by highlighting monarch conservation efforts, and then I'll take your questions. So as most of you probably are well aware, the monarch butterfly migration is an amazing phenomenon. In the spring, adults migrate from wintering grounds in Mexico for the eastern population and coastal California for the western population. And then through several generations, they migrate as far north as Canada. Then adults, again, three or four generations removed from those that began the trip in the spring, they, they travel back the entire distance to the watering grounds in the fall. And then these are the monarchs that will begin the northward migration again the following spring. So monarch butterflies have expanded across the globe to 29 countries. Um, thus our species status assessment looked at monarch butterflies globally. But the ancestral origins for monarchs worldwide are these long distance migratory populations found in Eastern and Western North America. And they were really the main focus of our analysis. So, so for some context, the Eastern population historically and currently supports over 90% of the world's monarchs. So even when the Western monarch population was doing really well, it was still a small fraction of migratory monarchs when you compare them to the massive monarch migration um, in the, that goes up through the middle of the country. Okay, so as these graphics show, monarch butterflies have been in decline for at least the past 20 years. The Eastern and Western monarch migratory populations are measured by estimating the populations at their overwintering sites in Mexico and coastal California each year. So the graph on the top with the orange bars shows the numbers for the Eastern population. And then the graph on the bottom with the green bars shows the numbers for the Western population. Okay, so, so monarchs in the eastern population, again, that's our orange bars, they cluster in massive numbers in a really small area in the mountains of central Mexico during winter. So it makes it impossible to count them individually. So instead, this population is estimated by, by the size of the area it occupies. So monarch numbers in the eastern population fell from about 45 acres, so that's like 385 million monarchs in 1996, to fewer than seven and a half acres, which is about 60 million monarchs in 2019. The numbers dipped to a low of about 14 million in 2013. That's the Eastern population. So the wintering monarchs in coastal California have seen a more precipitous decline from about 1.2 million butterflies in 1997 to fewer than 30,000 in 2019. And so my graph here is from our species status assessment. So we didn't even have the 2020 numbers at that time, but the 2020 numbers indicate that there are fewer than 2000 monarchs at overwintering sites in coastal California this year. Hmm. That's just devastating. Um, this is what um, Supervisor Parks mentioned before she got off. Um, so also notice on the graph with the Western numbers that um, those green bars are declining, even though the effort to count monarchs in the West has increased in the past decade, shown by the blue line. So, so there's no known single cause for the drop in monarch numbers, particularly in the West few time through time. However, there's multiple factors contributing to long-term decline. And this is habitat loss and degradation in overwintering groves and in breeding areas. 
pesticides, and a changing climate such as drought, increased storm severity, and temperature extremes. Um, I, we should also probably talk a little bit about, the, about at the end about um, non-native tropical milkweed and the creation of resident populations of monarchs in California. Um, but really the big picture, the big ticket items for overall decline is habitat loss, insecticides, and a changing climate. Cool. So in August 2014, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service received a petition to list the monarch butterfly under the Endangered Species Act. We made a substantial 90-day finding on the petition in December 2014, and then after some back and forth, we worked with the plaintiffs to extend the deadline for our 12-month findings to December 15, 2020, and this allowed us to gather additional years of overwintering data for our species status assessment. So part of why I'm presenting for you today is because back in December, we finally released our 12-month finding, and, and that's sort of the context for this presentation. Okay, so a species status assessment, or SSA, is an analysis of the best available science, which is the foundation for decisions under the Endangered Species Act. The assessment incorporates information regarding life history, biology, consideration of current and future threats to the species. So the Monarch SSA team consisted of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists from across the country, um, as well as representatives from the Midwest, Northeast, and Western associations of fish and wildlife, life, wildlife agencies. So we, we had a representative from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife on our team. Um, the final SSA, which is available on our website and describes the positive and negative influences on the future condition of monarchs, it also projects the future outcomes based on simulations. And I'll show you the results of those simulations here in a second. So the key influences affecting monarch viability are the availability of milkweed and nectar sources, the availability and quality of overwintering habitat in Mexico and California, exposure to insecticides, and then as I mentioned, the effects of climate change that result in exposure to unsuitably high temperatures or catastrophic weather events, and then conservation efforts that restore and improve habitat also influence monarch viability. All right, so the graphs here show the results of our population simulations. So I know it's kind of a lot, but let me try to walk through it. So, so the gray cone on each graph represents the probability of extinction over time, given each population's current size, growth rate, and environmental stochasticity level. So, and then, and then the light blue cone, which is sort of superimposed on that gray cone, is the probability of extinction under plausible future scenarios. So where the conditions may change in the future, again, maybe drought um, or conservation efforts, those things could change in the future. And so it's the, it's the simulations under those future scenarios. So what these graphs show is that the probability of extinction climbs when projected over time varying from 24 to 46% probability of extinction for the Eastern population in the next 30 years, and up to 92 to 95% probability of extinction for the Western population in the next 30 years. So at the current and projected population levels, both the Eastern and Western populations will become more vulnerable to catastrophic events, such as extreme sorts of widespread doubt, simply because population sizes will continue to decline. But I think we should go ahead and like, look at this western graph and you know we can all be hope we can all hope that we're wrong um but i think you know this is this is very serious for western monarchs okay so um the monitor conservation database was the primary tool we used to gauge the conservation gains made since 2014 those were also included gains were included in our projections um and these numbers represent the totals for the data provided by users the basic premise here is that almost 49,000 conservation efforts resulting in 5.6 million acres of monarch habitat um, across North America were in our database. So I was not in charge of this database, so if you have questions about it, I can try to answer them, um, but it is an ongoing effort to try to keep up to date on what people are doing in terms of monarch conservation so that we can include that in our, um, in our projections of extinction and species status assessment. Okay, so, so there are three outcomes to the Endangered Species Act petition process. 
the 12 month finding could be warranted. So if that is the finding, we publish a proposed rule to list the species as an or threatened in that open public comment period. We may also find that the listing is not warranted, which means that that petition process stops without a proposed listing. And we can determine that listing is warranted, but precluded by listing actions of a higher priority. And this is the finding that we made for the Monarch on December 15th, 2020. So through our national listing work plan, we prioritize workload based on the needs of candidate and petition species. And again, keep in mind that this warrant but precluded finding is for monarchs as a whole. So both that Western and Eastern population and all of the, um, all of the international populations that have um, resulted from their dispersal. So we decided again, warranted or precluded. So with this finding, the monarch butterfly becomes a candidate species. So that's a formal term to become a candidate. And what this means is that the US Fish and Wildlife Service will review the monarch status every year to determine if its listing priority should change. And we've added it to the national listing work plan for 2024 when we intend to issue a proposed rule if listing is still warranted at the time. So, so we only encourage continued efforts to improve the status of monarchs um, such that when we have to go reevaluate it, you know, maybe the status looks better both in the Eastern and Western populations. Monarchs benefit from widespread ongoing conservation measures that are currently helping to reduce threats. And they can certainly use additional conservation um, in the West, uh, the implementation of the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies conservation plans, it, it, conservation plan is a good one. There's also a monarch rights of way candidate conservation agreement with assurances that we're working with Caltrans on. Um, so, so the service is really committed to continuing to work with partners at all levels to try to improve the status of monarchs. Um, and, and since most of us on the call today are interested in Western monarchs, uh, I thought I'd end with a slide that has the highest priority actions to save Western monarchs from extinction. So, so the first is to protect and restore remaining overwintering groves. So these are really important. There's um, been troubles with the groves due to bad tree trimming practices and drought and beetles. And so the, the quality of the groves has been in decline. So protecting and enhancing the remaining groves is a high priority. Another priority, plant native milkweed and nectar plants in breeding habitat, especially early season emerging milkweed and early flowering nectar plants in California's Coast Range and Central Valley. So um, I think this would be really relevant to this group. Um, there are overwintering areas sort of in your area of responsibility. And then this would certainly be part of that, what we're calling like the first stopover zone. So when those Butterflies come off the overwintering groves kind of now, as things warm up in particular, they need high quality native species of milkweed and nectar. And the things that are emerging early, the species that are emerging early, they need that sort of not too close to the overwintering groves. So not within five miles, but outside of that five mile zone, it's really important. So that's a, that's a good action. Uh, next, Eliminate and reduce the use of pesticides, particularly insecticides when possible. Um, next, re report all monarch and milkweed observations, especially in the spring, to the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper or the iNatural app, iNaturalist app. So this helps us understand where monarchs go when they depart the overwintering grounds. And then finally, um, manage and enhance breeding and migration habitat across the Western states. Um, so with that, thanks so much for having me. Um, like I said, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service continues to take an all-hands-on-deck collaborative approach to monarch conservation, um, and I'm happy to take any questions depending on the, the group's time and availability. Thank you, Ms. Kat, and I do, I do want to open up the floor for questions. Madam Chair, I'll start out with a couple of questions. First of all, uh, are the Western populations considered a separate subspecies? What is their status? That's a good question. 
So the Western monarchs are genetically indistinguishable with the information that we have from Eastern monarchs, but they are operating demographically independently. So there hasn't been sufficient time for divergence, but they are operating in the sense of they're overwintering of the, of the coast. They're going through their generations migrating east. They're coming back west. And they're operating very independently from that big, huge eastern population. There's occasional mixing of butterflies through Arizona. But in general, they're operating demographically independently. So um, this is actually not a loaded question. Um, I suppose it is, but uh, as a point of information, how low does an insect population have to be before it moves up on your priority list? So less than 2,000 individuals would seem to me, why, why wouldn't that um, automatically rank the monarch uh, at the top of the list? Great, great question. So again, the issue is that it's not a separate subspecies or distinct population segment. It's the one population of the species Danaeus plexippus, which is, is the Western, the Eastern, and these international populations that have dispersed from the migratory phenomenon. So the reason that the monarch butterfly is not higher on the priority list is because there actually are quite a lot of them left overall. And there are conservation efforts underway. And those, those are kind of like the two factors we take into account when we're putting things in the priority list. If we could actually evaluate the Western population as a distinct population segment, which the Endangered Species Act allows us to do for vertebrates, but not for vertebrates, I agree, we would be talking about something very different. You would absolutely list that as endangered, but because the actual law, the Endangered Species Act, doesn't allow us to just lift the population, we have to look at the whole thing. That's a really good question. And then finally, uh, we're talking about uh, preserving groves. Uh, are those groves of eucalyptus? Uh, what are the what are the groves we're talking about? What what trees? Yeah, good question. So most 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 of them in sort of the southern part of the range that we're talking about. You all are this is your jurisdiction. Uh, most of them are eucalyptus, but there are still some um, cypress, pine, and sycamore that they will use. And as we're talking about um, enhancement, so trying to sort of reinvigorate some of these groves that are in disrepair um, a mix of trees is being suggested because as probably all of you know you could blue them eucalyptus are non-native so it's better to go with native species but um, so for example Pismo State Beach was one of the few places that had any monarchs this past year they've been doing a really lovely job with their restoration and they're doing a mix of still some blue gum eucalyptus but some of these other cypress pine um, oak sycamore trees Thank this you. is Rory. May I, could you expand a little bit on the issue of the non-native tropical milkweeds? And yeah, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. So, one of the things that's tricky about the Western monarchs is that you know the the migratory phenomenon, right? So they overwinter at the coast and then they move successively east and then they end up coming back and they're they're overwintering here so if you have and part of that's because they're following the senescent the they're following the phenology of their food so their wildflowers that they drink the nectar from and the milkweed plants that they lay their eggs on and so non-native tropical milkweed especially in the coast so this is like a big deal for our area here pulls the individuals out of the migratory population and they can just breed year round. They don't have to leave because the non-native tropical milkweed stays green year round. They're, the problem with that is number one, it's junk food. So it doesn't have all the things that are good for monarchs that native milkweeds have. And number two, they're more likely to get a protozoan disease if they don't move on. It's the acronym is OE. That's like a short a shorthand for the species name. And so the, the that, that resident breeding population, you may think you have monarchs in your yard, but you actually might have this resident breeding population that is a threat to the migratory population because it's pulling individuals out 
of the migratory population into this resident population that's on a slow decline. So I think that one of the things that we can do in our area is work with sort of public landscaping to make sure that we're not using tropical milkweed and to work with nurseries to try to not be selling tropical milkweed, or at least if we are gonna sell it, lots of education about what this may be doing to the viability of Western monarchs. Thanks for bringing that up. Any additional questions? Yeah, no. this, this is Matt Holland here. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit about the value of them beyond their beauty? I imagine they're pollinators, but there may be some other aspects of that. And also, um, would you say anything about the El Capitan Grove up there at, uh, in Santa Barbara County? Is that still viable? So I think you would be talking about the Elwood Mesa Grove. That's a really huge one. Anyway, let's talk about the first question was, uh, oh, their importance other than their their charisma and beauty. Yes, they're pollinators. They're not like amazing pollinators, um, but they are good pollinators. So they're definitely part of our pollinator community. I think that in some ways are also they're they're occupying this canary in the coal mine role for insects in general. The data on California butterflies and bees, native butterflies and bees, are are similar across taxa the species. So we're seeing these declines in in our native insect fauna that that. Is, is on a similar trajectory to what we're seeing with the monarchs. So if we can reduce the threats to monarch butterflies, such as habitat loss, degradation, insecticides, that's going to help all of our other native insect fauna that are also pollinators as well. And then the other question was about LCAP, and I think so the, the really big grove that's closest to us is that one in Goleta, Elwood Mesa, Elwood, Maine. And um, so the city of Goleta is, is doing a plan to try to restore that, that big, really incredible overwintering sites. They had essentially no butterflies there this year at all. Unbelievable to even imagine that if you guys have been there, you know, it's, it's just that they're like chandeliers of butterflies, you know, hanging off these branches and there were none. Um, and part of that is again, just the sheer numbers, but there's been a lot of habitat degradation of those eucalyptus and a lot of it's been drought. Thank you. Uh, additional questions? I know we have a couple of public comments, but we'll take those under the comment public period. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a question. Please. 